So far in the series, we've given six or so minute breakdowns of how to write paper types that can be applied to almost any discipline, in theology, the behavioral sciences, and the humanities. But in this video, we want to get a little more specific. Tyndale is, after all, most known for its focus on biblical studies, so today we're going to address a paper type that's unique to that discipline, the exegetical paper. But what is that paper type? How do you prepare for it, and, and how do you actually write it? That's what we'll cover today in eight minutes or less so that you can write the best exegetical paper possible. Ready? Let's go. Let's start with what exegesis is. To oversimplify it, exegesis is drawing out the meaning of a passage. This is not reading your own ideas into the text, that's eisegesis, but rather interpreting as close as possible the text in its original context, as well as what that means for us today. Now you'll do this deep dive with a short ter passage of scripture. Some professors only want a passage of 7 to 10 verses, while others might be okay with you exegeting an entire chapter. The key, and this will be a trend in this video, is to pay attention to your assignment instructions. Now in most papers, your first step is to turn to the research, journal articles, scholarly books, and the like. But that's not the case for exegetical papers. We'll come back to those sources for sure, but for now we need a better understanding of the text itself. So how do we do that? Well, conveniently, there's an entire exegetical process that you can follow to uncover the context and meaning of a text. Tyndall covers this process in detail in hermeneutics for the undergraduates and biblical interpretation for seminary students, but I'll give you the short version here. The first few steps of the exegetical process have to do with the who, what, where, when, and why of the text. So this is answering questions like 1. Authorship and date. Who wrote the book? When? And are there any controversies over these details? 2. Audience. Who is the book written to or for? Was it for Israel, a Gentile audience, a letter to a particular city? And 3. Purpose. Why did the author write it? Is it a historical record, a prophetic warning, a letter answering a specific question, or does the text fulfill some other purpose? And then there's 4. Genre. This is the category of literature the passage belongs to. So for example, the Psalms are poetry meaning we shouldn't read a psalm as literal historical fact. But even the Gospels or Chronicles aren't doing history according to our 21st century standards. So in this step, we take time to understand how the conventions of your passage's genre affect how we understand that passage. And then lastly, for this section anyway, 5. Historical context. This is identifying any key historical details about people, locations, the time period, etc. that will help you understand what context the author was writing in. Now, I know I said not to do scholarly research yet, and I stand by that, but to learn these contextual details, it's okay to look at a commentary or Bible dictionary. Just don't jump ahead to the interpretive sections yet, that'll come. So after these authorship and history pieces, the next steps involve understanding the text and passage itself. So we'll start with six, translation, grammar, and vocabulary. In this multifaceted step, we do word studies and read multiple translations, preferably translations with different philosophies around how literally to translate the original text. We do this to look for discrepancies in wording, definitions, or how grammar usage affects our interpretation of the passage. But we should also look at the passage's structure, that's seven. This is breaking down what you feel is the logical order of your passage. Is it structured a certain way narratively, thematically? Does some other pattern link the ideas in your text? See, knowing how your text is structured might provide better insights into what it's trying to reveal. And then we want to cover how your passage fits into the larger narrative context. So we have eight, literary context, which is looking at how the passage fits into the rest of the book it's a part of, and nine, biblical context, looking at how the passage fits into the rest of scripture. Both of these steps involve reading a part in light of the whole. So for example, how does your passage fit into the arguments, stories, and ideas that came before and after it in the book? And how does it fit into the larger biblical narrative? Does your passage address a recurring theme or idea in the book or Bible? Does your passage quote, or is it quoted by, another part of scripture? And how do these passages connect? And so on. And then 10, theology and application. Finally, we're moving beyond the original context and looking at how the passage applies to us today. How do the themes in your passage fit into a larger theological framework, and what can we take away from what the original audience was being told? Which takes us to the last step, secondary sources. Yes, now's the time to dig into, or dig more fully into, the commentaries, books, and journal articles to see how other scholars and theologians support, challenge, or contradict your interpretation of the passage. 
allow this reading to confirm or help you refocus some of the conclusions that you've already come to about the text. But let me make this clear. An exegetical paper is not, I repeat, not a summary of the exegetical process we just did. Your professor doesn't want to see heading one, authorship, heading two, audience, no. Rather, you want to incorporate only the most relevant information from this process as you fulfill the paper's true purpose to break down what the passage is all about. Now, exactly how you order this paper will vary by professor, so again, pay attention to your assignment instructions in case they want you to cover certain aspects as their own sections. But when your professor doesn't provide you with a specific structure to use, I recommend something like the following. As always, begin with an introduction. At the very least, this should introduce what passage you've selected and the main interpretation you're trying to draw out. Next, you'll want to cover the background context. This is typically going to include the relevant issues you've found regarding authorship, date, audience, purpose, and perhaps genre. But again, only cover what's relevant or significant to your text meaning. You don't need to spend ages on dating the text if scholars all but unanimously agree that it was written at X time. But if it's one of Paul's letters that has two or three potential writing dates, you might need to outline that controversy and explain which date you feel is most accurate. As an aside, depending on the length of your paper and how much your professor wants devoted to the next section, you might just include this context as part of your introduction, but in most cases, a short, separate introduction is preferred. And then after this context section, we shift into providing a breakdown of the passage's meaning at its original time of writing. Often, this will start with an overview of the passage's structure, either in paragraph form or in some cases as a point form outline. And then we go through the passage in more detail. Some professors want a verse by verse analysis of the text, going deep into exactly what each verse is contributing to our understanding of the themes, ideas of the text, but others want more of a sectional breakdown looking at the passage's meaning a few verses at a time. And in some cases, though admittedly less frequently, you'll structure this section according to the passage's main themes, drawing out the relevant verses regardless of where they fall in the passage. In other words, this is the section where you'll cover the relevant issues you've found in translation, vocabulary, grammar, and the literary and biblical context. Only instead of covering them in that order, you'll simply go through the passage systematically. And the last section of the body is theology and application. Now some professors may want this included in that verse by verse breakdown above, but often they want you to separate the text's original meaning from what we do with it today. So in this section, you'll describe how the narrative or lessons of the text tie into the larger theological concerns. And you'll show how we can learn from or apply this passage in our current cultural or ecclesial context. Now by all means be creative with your application, but also make sure it's consistent with what the passage was trying to say. Now you'll notice we don't have a separate section for secondary sources, and that's because it's actually going to be incorporated throughout the entirety of your paper. So when you come across authorship concerns, or issues with literary context, or something in the grammar that you found in the journals and the scholarly works, include it there in the relevant sections of your paper. And then wrap things up with a conclusion. These tend to be pretty short, just recap the main meaning, takeaways, and applications that you've described above, and then you're done. And with that, we've covered everything you need to learn about writing exegetical papers in 8 minutes or less. I know, I know, that was abrupt, but this one was getting a little long compared to the rest of the series. I hope you find this helpful alongside your exegetical paper instructions, the latter of which should always be your starting point, but I trust that this video will work as a good refresher or gap filler as you write. All the best with your papers, and we'll see you next time. Take care!